Hey, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to Facebook Live. I'm, I'm trying to multitask today, so I'm going to talk on the phone while I'm talking to you. It's probably not a good thing. Okay, put the phone down. So, um, hello, everybody. And today is December 13th, so uh, we're halfway through December. And uh, welcome, everybody, to our latest uh, Facebook Live. You know, this thing where I was talking on the phone kind of makes me laugh because I don't know how many of you have to go to meetings, which I do occasionally, and I always notice that people are on their phone, not so much that they're talking, but they're like looking at their messages, and so the conference is going on or whatever the conference is, and everybody's on their phone checking their email as if somebody important was actually going to email them that exact moment and that exact time. You know, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, you could look. You can check your stock prices, you can check your email, you can see if Google is up or the video or GE or whatever companies you may own go up or down. But uh, you know, probably it's not like the good use of uh, everyone's effort. And uh, one of the reasons we spoke before about CME is that uh, one of the things good going to a meeting is you're at least paying attention. Now you can always look at your phone at a meeting, but when you're home and you're watching CME on computers or you know you're reading some sort of CME pro program some printed thing you're on your phone you're on your tablet you're on your computer you're watching TV you're looking up you're eating uh, juicy fruits or uh, Goldenberg chews or something so got to pay attention anyway uh, I picked coronary CTA as this week's topic just several things I've noticed and um, I did give a refresher course uh, NASCI, which is one of the main cardiac organizations that runs really good meeting in September, um, runs, I think, a 10-session, three hours a session, well, 90 minutes times three, times 10 sessions at RSNA on a range of cardiac topics, and I've spoken at that for a number of years, and I think Jill Jacobs is in charge this year, and Jill did a great job as always, and, he, and you get a very large crowd. They probably have like 500-plus people. Uh, which is very good considering for any meeting at RSNA, for any refresher course. But when you go to non-cardiac meetings, so you do the coronary artery meeting, uh, everyone there by definition is doing coronaries almost, or they're about to do what they want to do, and they, they're just uh, making sure they're doing things correctly. But if you go to regular meetings, like our CT meeting, um, I was at the San Diego meeting, uh, many ESI, you name the meeting, it doesn't matter where it is. It ends up that when you ask the question, how many people are doing coronary CTA in practice, it's probably about 10, max out of 15%. It's essentially the same number if I ask how many people are doing virtual colonoscopy, and it's probably a 10 or 15% as well. So it, it does make me think about, you know, why we're over a decade after we started doing coronaries, why don't people do coronary artery CT in practice? Now, there are a number of possible reasons, okay? One reason is you don't have the technology. I, at a minimum, you need 64 slice CT, but 128 is better. So you need fast scanners, fast acquisition. So perhaps technology-wise, you're not where you need to be. And that's possible in some outpatient centers, even some hospitals. 64 slice is kind of tough doing coronaries. We did it, we were happy with it, but it's not as good as the faster scanners. So perhaps technology is one reason. The second reason perhaps is what if you have the technology, why are you still not doing it? One comment people do make always is the reimbursements. And reimbursements are, uh, though many societies have tried to push cardiac reimbursements, they're not really where they need to be. I think we get more or the same for reading a non-contrast scan of the chest, and you're going to spend a whole lot of less time with a non-contrast of the chest. You'll probably read 10 of those before you read one coronary, particularly if it's a coronary with lots of calcification, and you're trying to determine whether it is a 50 or 60% stenosis or 30 or 40% stenosis. So it's not, um, it's not lucrative in that regard. You need to have good technologists because coronary CTA is really a very time study where you're, um, you have a few seconds to get it right. You're ejecting five to six cc's a second. It's a very fast acquisition, short distance, but you need to get it right. If not, you have 
you know, you have contamination, you have artifact on the right side of the heart. A lot of things that can go wrong and give you a really bad coronary study. So the technology is very, very important. And then you need good techs who can do the technology. All of our techs who do cardiac are cardiac certified. So from the uh, different organizations or the ACR, there's certification for technologists. That's a good thing to do because Excuse me. It means that people have taken enough time to take a test, certify, take enough courses, take some CME, and be competent. And so that, that tends to, uh, you know, help improve your quality or at least maintain a minimum standard of quality. And then, of course, the issue is on the radiologist side. You have to read the coronary studies. They take longer to read. It's not your typical, again, chest or stone study from the ER it takes time, particularly when there's lots of calcification present. Um, so it's a, it's a time sink. And then the question also becomes, what hours do you offer coronary CTA? You could say off the top of your head 24 seven, but it may be difficult. It may be difficult both in terms of doing the patients as well as interpreting the scan. So there are many places I know that do 24 seven. I can't think of any off the top of my head most places like us, if they do service, give services, sorry about the yawning, they give it to seven o'clock at night. So we do seven to seven, uh, seven days a week. That's our rule, the sevens. But you know, what about 24 seven? But then again, if you have the technologists, are they trained to do it? Is the radiologist covering that 24 seven trained to do it? I know that uh, people, when Claudia came along, we're trying to make a business out of interpreting things 24 seven, where you would send them the images, they would interpret them and send you back a report. There's some logic to that, but it never took off in part because cardiac CT on a 24 seven basis hasn't taken off and most places don't do it. Again, many hospitals don't have the best scanner in the ER. So there's 16 or 64 probably. It's just not up to snuff what you need to be able to do. So I think that's a big thing. However, on the other hand, coronary CT is really good. You read all the articles. Uh, if you do coronary CTA, you decrease by a third the number of patients who go for cath. Coronary CTA is particularly good. You know, again, whether your agonist score is zero or it's a higher number, uh, looking at the significance of calcified and non-calcified plaque. Remember, you can see calcified plaque on the uh, non-contrast scans, but you're trying to guesstimate what the degree of stenosis is, which you can't. I mean, we know that the higher the calcium score, the higher your Agassiz score, the more likely you have stenosis, but it's not a one-to-one -one correlation by any means. And we also know that many patients, particularly inner city African-Americans, their calcium scores tend to be lower, yet when we do the CTA, they have high-grade stenosis. So even in your population you're dealing with, if you're dealing with inner city population, a lot of African-Americans be aware that their calcium score is really gives you false confidence that there's nothing going on, that the score is going to be zero, but the stenosis will be high. Again, the advantage of coronary CTA over calcium scoring, surely across a range of settings, but particularly in the chest pain setting, is that with or suspected chest pain, calcium scores give you a value that you can use to manage patients, perhaps for different medications. But you really can't quantify the degree of stenosis. You just can't. And when I give my talk at RSNA, I ask that and I show a score of 160. I say, what's the chance of a 50% stenosis or not? Well, you can't really judge it. Again, as I said, the higher the score, the more calcifications, the more likely you're to have a stenosis. That makes some sense, but it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. So you can have a high score and you have no stenosis. Remember, a lot of times the calcification is eccentric. You have a high score in a ring calcification, but the vessel is widely patent. It's like a perfect matter because we're looking at vessel patency. What matters to your heart is the blood getting to it, and what matters is the lumen. So a good open lumen is wonderful, even if the wall is calcified. You can think about it as a pipe, an old pipe with some rust. As long as there's no holes in the pipe, as long as the pipe is widely patent, it's going to have lots of water going through it. So that becomes important. Um, other things related to cardiac CTA, um, there's a lot now about lower dose studies, and we have been doing that for a while. I think many people have. Uh, the use of uh, 
Visipay works very nicely. There's been several articles, including our own experience about Visi, that Visi's not only is it safer from a renal perspective, but Visi is also safer in the cardiac situation because of the non-critical findings. Remember, we talk about non-critical findings, feeling warm, feeling uncomfortable, all of those things. And, you know, perhaps in your mind or someone's mind, some administrator's mind, it's not that important unless they get a scan, of course. But the big thing is that if you feel warm or funny taste, you feel uneasy, you're not going to hold your breath with the same intensity and success as you would otherwise. And so often the selection of the contrast material, getting rid of those secondary effects like warmth, discomfort, nausea becomes very critical. With cardiac CT, you have one under 10 second spell to cover this much real estate and get it right. If you have this jaggedness, if you this patient doesn't hold their breath perfectly and they ask you a question, what you're rejecting, um, you're going to have all sorts of problems. So I think it's very, very important to recognize that. So contrast becomes critical. Needles become critical. You need good access. We want to inject five to six cc's a second. It's the highest volume study we do or volume injection rate. You're doing only about 60 or 70 cc's of contrast. Some people have even done less, but that's a pretty good uh, magic number to make things work pretty nicely. Now let's see, um, I see Philip Taylor says, good afternoon. There's a lot of people online, both on Instagram, who are waving, on, on Facebook, but this might be a good time if people have any questions. I see Mark DePaulis is online. Hey, Mark. Um, so if anyone has any questions about cardiac CT, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, one of the things we looked at, of course, in my talk was some of the vascular anomalies, whether it's coronary fistulas, whether it's coronary artery aneurysms, are all things you need to be able to recognize. So again, you need to be able to really think about the studies. I, the last thing I want to mention is training. And when we have our CME courses, one of the things we do is we have hands-on training. And one of the most popular things is the cardiac. So now I will say that if you, um, I don't care what vendor you have, as long as you have a decent machine, you better learn how to use it. And I think one of the things that becomes a problem for many people is they don't know how to use their workstation. And physicians are often the worst because they were busy when the person from the company came to give apps training. They didn't go to apps training. They were too busy reading. And now all of a sudden they're by themselves praying to the machine. Hopefully it's going to give them the information. So um, I think it's important that if you – don't know how to use your machine, whatever your vendor is, call your vendor up. They often can do remote training. They often can do on-site training. They often can send you to areas of training. They can send you to places like us when we do our uh, CT course, February 7 to 10, all of hands-on training on VIA. So um, it, is, it is something you need to know. If you can't do the coronary studies, you feel so uncomfortable with doing them, you're surely not going to do them because it's just something that you know people feel very nervous about. So it's important to learn how to do them and just practice. It's not really that hard. The good news is the software has gotten substantially better. Let's see, what percentage of some now, uh, Ms. Louis Monier asked the question, what percent occlusion of the coronary arteries in the case therapeutic operation? I think it depends on who you're speaking to, but uh, typically when it starts getting over 70%, they're going to do some sort of intervention. I think under 70%, surely under 50%, people are going to watch. But I've seen also 70 tends to be the magic number, depending where it is and what the patient's symptoms are. But that's not a hard, fast rule, but it's something to think about. Let me see, Liliana joined. Hey, Liliana. Liliana, uh, you know, worked with me for a number of years. She's been in Texas at MD Anderson area for the last couple of years, and now she's her husband are back at Stanford, so we wish them the best of luck, and I think they're moving to Palo Alto. Uh, wish them the best of luck. Um, what is the number of, okay, here's another question. What's the number of studies you need to become competent at doing them? That's a good question. People would talk about 50 or 100. I think a lot of it is seeing a lot of cases. So I think on the software, if you're well-trained and you have good software, the software is much easier now 
because a lot of it is automated. People are putting AI into it, so a lot of it's automated. So I think learning the software is much quicker than it was five years ago. So if you did 30 to 50 cases of a range of cases and you feel very comfortable with manipulating the software and using it well, I think that's probably okay. In terms of looking at cases, I think I can't give you a magic number. I think you need to look at a lot of cases. So if you look at CT as us, it's well over a thousand cases. That may be too much, but you want to look at cases like some fistulae, some coronary artery aneurysms, some pseudo lesions, some spasm. You want to look at a lot of things. So I can't give you a number. It depends how much you've done already, but the more you look at, the more comfortable you will you'll be. If you haven't seen a coronary artery fistula, you're not going to recognize it. If you haven't seen anomalous vessels, you might miss them or miss its significance. So I think it's like everything else we do in radiology. It's really important to keep seeing more and more of the cases. If you don't do that, you're going to have all sorts of problems. So maybe that's not the answer you wanted, or maybe it is, but it does take some time to get good at it. Uh, John Haller, how often do you see soft plaque in an individual who does not have a lot of calcium within the arterial walls? It's not uncommon, and as I mentioned, in patients who are African-American, it's particularly common. I see a lot of patients with very high-grade stenosis, their agonist score is zero. Uh, in African-American patients, a zero score does not have the same importance it does in a white population. It's just because uh, we see a lot more plaque in the white population, African-American population, less calcified plaque, more high-grade stenosis. So it's very population-related. So let's see if there's any other questions. Uh, you can, you can email us. Uh, we're, we're doing a bunch of work on CTSS, the website. If you haven't been to the website in a while, you missed a lot, or you're missing a lot on a daily basis, it's constantly changing. We have a lot more information up there. And it's easier to use. And as of January 1st, we're going to announce, hopefully in the next couple of days, this new Ask the Fish where you can ask us questions, and I can answer them in a much more efficient manner, in a much more logical uh, type of format. So. We hope you like that. And with that, I'll say, I would say hasta la vista, but I'm not sure I know what that means. I'll say see you tomorrow, or at least see you next week. Have a great day. Bye.